from the top. Take two. All right, people are typing in the chat now. We have a lot of relieved people. They could see it, but couldn't hear it. So my apologies. All right, so I just Mas wanted to- uh, here we are in take two. Thank you so much um, for being here. Um, and again, I want to thank Chris Banayatu for her um, and Rush Soccer for for allowing me this space to to present on such a an important topic. Um, today we're going over coaching for social justice, um, and I just want to make it clear that I think that there's um, a number of important conversations that we need to have around this, as and as it relates to our role as educators and as as soccer coaches. Um, one thing I want to make clear is that, you know, um, everything that we talk about today needs to also be backed up with uh, action. And, and one of the main things in youth soccer in, in the United States is providing access for uh, underserved populations, right? Um, we all know, of course, that it's very expensive to play youth soccer in this country. And that's something that we need to remedy. Um, that's not necessarily the uh, main focus of this talk, because I recognize that um, if you're on this call, mostly you, maybe you work with kids uh, in, already in a, you know, quote unquote, elite or premier youth soccer environment. Um, and so I think there are still important takeaways that we can have um, so that when you go back to whatever space you work in, um, you have action steps to improve uh, the quality of the experience for your kids. And so that's the goal. Uh, and with that, I want to make it clear that there are names that we should not forget um, because I know that uh, certain names grab headlines more than others. Um, but that also says something about who we are as a people and how quickly we 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 tend to forget. Um, so we don't we shouldn't forget, you know, Brianna Taylor. And I mentioned her because it was recent this year and um, also the nature in which she lost her life uh, when she was sleeping in her own bed and um you know uh, cops busted in with a no-knock warrant um and it was her partner who actually did what i think most americans would consider the reasonable logical thing in that moment um when someone busts into your house in the middle of the night um and he was arrested for his efforts and she lost her life so something's wrong there and we need to uh, remember her um and, and speak her name always uh, the other person I want us never to forget is Tamir Rice. Um, and I think this one's important because it speaks to how we as a nation also um, treat young kids of color um, and how they are often uh, not given the same benefit of the doubt um, and the same, the same love and nurturing um, that we give other children. Um, and it's important. So if you're not familiar with his case, um, you should definitely go back and look at that. Um, but the way he lost his life, I think, is pretty, um, it was pretty egregious. And the fact that people weren't out in the streets in the same way that we are now um, is, is telling, right? And I understand there's complexities to that. Um, but I know for me, uh, his, his story is extremely, uh, extremely relevant. So the guiding principles for today. Um, the first thing is that growth requires introspection. Um, that in order to grow, in order to expand our abilities and our worldview, uh, we must be willing to look at, at things. We must be aware. Um, and, and when it comes to social justice, especially when it comes to talking about uh, racism, it, it's like the one conversation that people seem to think it'll get better if you avoid it, which is just not true, right? Um, nothing's going to get better by just avoiding it. You have to face it head on. The second thing principle guiding this is that empathy matters, right? And, and when people are telling their stories, when we're talking about uh, uh, human dignity, it's important that we understand that in order to be an ally, that you, you must sacrifice something. And that something is probably your own comfort. You must sacrifice your own comfort in order to be in solidarity, uh, because it's not easy. And that's why I think it's important to remember, for example, that Eric Reed uh, in this picture stood toe to toe with Colin Kaepernick. Um, and he also was was subject to uh, uh, abuse and he also lost something, um, but he, he understood that and he was still willing to do it. So that's an important thing. And the third thing is that language shapes understanding, right? So the words we use are really important uh, in terms of 
shaping our view of the world uh, and shaping then um, how we go about changing things. So in order for us to work for justice, we have to speak uncomfortable truths. So words like racism, anti-blackness, white supremacy, uh, violence, uh, murder, uh, these things are, are key for us to understand. Objectives for this presentation and beyond. Again, I said that uh, earlier that in our first go about that we are going to go over three things over and over, which are awareness, intentionality, and responsibility. Those three things, um, of course, that acronym AIR, um, I think is, is telling, especially when you consider um, you know, the I can't breathe movement and so many people in the streets because um, of that idea. And that really what you're gonna hear from me is um, our role as educators and with football is to help our kids discover their air, right? It's help them play with air. I believe football is about finding air, it's about playing with space. Um, and so the objective for today, to be aware of our role as educators, right? To examine, uh, uh, and be critical about our role uh, in order for us to be courageous advocates for social justice. Uh, number two, to be intentional about making meaningful connections between the game of football and these complex issues of systemic injustice. Uh, and then finally, our target uh, is to be responsible enough to empower our student athletes to make transformational change. That is the target. So everything that you're going to hear today is is a self-reflection of sorts, right? I'm not I'm not going about this um, as if you know I alone have the answers or uh, I'm speaking things that other uh, much wiser, more accomplished, more eloquent people haven't said. Uh, far from it, right? People have been saying this for a long time, and this presentation is my interpretation of how. Uh, we can use this wonderful game um, or whatever we're engaged in, whatever space we're in, how we can make those connections between that and developing young people for a better future. And of course, my the reason that I do this work um, is because I see my son here, pictured here, Mateo, he's about 15 months old now. Um, I see him and all the kids that I work with um, and I want a better future for him. Um, I want him, I, I showed a picture of Tamir Rice earlier, um, I want my son to live longer than Tamir Rice did. Uh, and that shouldn't be a uh, difficult ask. It shouldn't be a, 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 a very challenging thing. Um, but in this world, when you look like me uh, and you look uh, like Mateo does, um, that can be a challenge. So that is my why. Uh, a little bit of my journey. Um, you can see my greater why as well. My a part of my why is is uh, develop quality people and build community. And football is just a vehicle for that. Um, currently, I serve as the U14 coach um, in the academy of the Columbus Crew, uh, Major League Soccer. And um, I got there uh, in part by doing work in Seattle that, I, that I'm very proud of, um, and that that still continues in some aspects, but um, it's slightly different now because of my new role. Uh, but essentially, I started an organization called The Rising Point, uh, which started on, on three pillars. Number one, to provide access for uh, low-income families to, to experience this game. Uh, number two, to provide quality teaching in the game, right? To teach um, the game from, from uh, a paradigm of finding space, of playing with air. Uh, and then number three, to, to build community, right? To connect uh, uh, the game to the lived experience of, of our youth. Um, and that's the picture down at the bottom right. That's um, from a film that we shot for The Rising Point a couple summers ago. Um, some incredible kids. And then up at the right, you can see uh, is the Columbus Crew U14 team from this last season. Um, it's an amazing group. So um, this is the work that that I believe very strongly in. Um, and, I, and I don't divorce the, the mission of social justice from uh, how I teach the game of football, uh, because I believe that ultimately um, our challenge isn't just learning how to train and win, uh, it's to bring together separate individuals to forge a unified identity, uh, to build community. And this is an example, 
of uh, some of the kids who uh, are often left out of U.S. soccer clubs um, because of, of how expensive the game is and because uh, many cub clubs are in predominantly white spaces. Um, and this is at an elementary school in the city of Seattle um, from our soccer in schools program last year. Um, and these kids, we were there, I was there twice a week. Um, and it was honestly probably the only time um, during the week where they had access to any sort of organized, I say that loosely, um, because we did a lot of free play, which is important as well, but um, any sort of organized, you know, coaching and, and, and um, support within the game. Um, and so Matanda. that says a lot. Yes, sir. Matanda, the first question has come in, and this is related to this point, and I, I know you started to answer it. This is yeah. from Debbie Scholes, and her question is, is how as coaches can we re reach out to the black and brown communities, people to encourage them to play soccer without a financial burden on the family? Yes, yeah, so I I will speak. That's a great question. I appreciate that question, and I think it's so. First, I would say um, they're already they're they're already playing soccer, as you can see from this picture. And then it's a it's an it's a question of um, access rather than sort of demand. Um, I personally know I can tell you from personal experience that demand is there. What I'll say, and this is what I what I started off with, is um, you know. It, this is an issue, it's a larger systemic issue that we as a soccer nation have to address and have to address more forcefully um, in terms of investment, um, in terms of also sacrifice, because some people might have to sacrifice something. And uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you are at a club that costs, you know, $3,000 for everybody to participate, and part of that, of course, goes to pay and coaches, um, then maybe there are some uncomfortable and hard conversations that we need to have for coaches in terms of, well, how much should a youth soccer coach actually make? You know, how many teams should you coach? That sort of thing, whatever it takes to drive the cost down. Um, another thing is also transportation. I mean, there's so many complex issues, um, but the demand is there. And you can see from this picture, the demand is there. These kids had a blast playing. Um, and what I did with the Rising Point was we went into schools because we knew that the kids were there. Um, and so it was a question of us uh, going to where they already were so that uh, they uh, didn't, um, didn't have to travel far um, and then they could, they could access the sport. So um, I can address it more, especially at the end for, for questions, but um, um, let's, if we can hold off on those, I, will, I might speak to some of these questions that people have. Um, but no, it's, it's a great one. I appreciate that. So getting into it a little deeper um, in terms of simplicity and, and complexity. Uh, I, I put this up because, again, I want to make it clear, just like the, the, the last question. There are simple ideas and then there are the complexities of how these things come across. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand that we're always both in how we teach the game, but also how we, we, we um, go about tackling uh, challenging social issues that we're all, we're always uh, going back and forth between the two. And you can see here, the objective of a Rubik's Cube is simple. Get all of the colors aligned, right? Get a, every single side, uh, um, every face to, to be the same color. How you go about doing that for anyone who's tried to solve a Rubik's Cube is, is challenging, it's complex. Uh, similarly, we look at our nation, it was founded on simple ideas. Right? It was founded on the idea of, of liberty and justice, but for a very narrow uh, segment of the population, for uh, uh, wealthy, property, Christian, uh, white males. That's what the nation was founded on. The complexity of it is how that idea then uh, uh, was, was put forth throughout everything that's happened here. So the events, the actions, and all of the policies uh, that, have, that have taken place and that still currently exist. Uh, and so it's important for us to understand that. And how it relates to football, it, it's a simple sport. And you see this picture, right? It's as simple as I score on one goal and I defend the other. Uh, the social, political, economic, geographical power dynamics surrounding the game are complicated, but the game itself is simple. Um, and I think, again, touching on that, that last question, it might be as simple as starting 
uh, uh, futsal leagues or going to parks and starting, you know, recreational soccer on concrete surfaces um, because this is the barest form of the game. But even in this, there's there's great uh, uh, complexity and opportunities for learning for kids. This picture actually comes from uh, the last youth club I was working at in Seattle before I joined the Columbus crew. Um, and these kids had actually never played street soccer before. So before we started our, our official season, um, I said, hey, we're going to spend some of the preseason playing street soccer. Um, and they had a blast. Um, and it, obviously, you can see how it doesn't take very much, um, but they still had access to, to the sport in this way. Getting to our objectives and the action steps I laid out before. So being aware, being intentional, and being responsible. Um, awareness in a social context starts with knowing your history. It starts with knowing what's going on in this country. Uh, if you can, for those of you who are familiar with um, Marcelo Bielsa, uh, legendary coach and currently at, at Leeds United, and there's been a recent documentary that, that has been put out on him. Um, and then one of the things I pulled out that was so uh, powerful was hearing about how whenever Marcelo Bielsa takes a job, he goes to that place, and in this case, uh, uh, England and Leeds, and he studies, he, he lives there for a little bit, and he studies the people. He studies the history. He walks in the streets. He talks to people. He just kind of gets a sense for uh, the context and where he's at. And that's important. And, and the reason this is so important is whenever we're working, wherever we're working, it's important to understand the context of that space that we're in. And in this country, the history uh, is very clear. It's like somebody watching game film. If you are not aware about Tulsa and 1921 and what took place there, uh, then you're missing a crucial understanding of why so many people are in the streets now and where this pain uh, uh, and this anger comes from when you see life being taken away uh, the, way it, the way it has been. Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, was the home of a place called Black Wall Street. Um, and I encourage you to look this up if you haven't uh, been aware of this history before. Um, but essentially what took place is uh, white mobs destroyed what was at that time the most prominent black community uh, in, in, this, in the United States. Uh, black owned businesses, thriving communities, people who were doing exactly what uh, uh, America often asks of, of oppressed people, which is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And they did that. And what happened is their community was uh, uh, taken away from them, right? Uh, and what started it, what started it was, like so many other cases, was apparently, ostensibly, it was uh, a black man who uh, made advances or, or abused uh, a white woman in an elevator in downtown Tulsa uh, as they rode up three three floors or something like that, um, which of course suggests that clearly this was something that was planned um, all along, right? And it didn't take much. Um, so it's important for us to know these stories. This next slide is uh, important for a couple of reasons. Um, I don't know if people saw, um, for example, what Drew Brees uh, said when it was the question was put to him about uh, whether or not he was what he thought about players kneeling for the national anthem once the NFL returned. Uh, and he said, you know, I don't want people I'll never agree with people disrespecting the flag. And uh, and he went on about his grandfather serving. Um, and I think what's important to pull from that is this. That when you see an image like this, and of course this is a, 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 a black veteran, right, of World War II returning home to Jim Crow laws. And why that's important is the idea that somehow uh, peacefully protesting during the national anthem or, uh, or somehow protesting the flag even um, is, is disrespectful. The only way you can have that viewpoint is to erase the black experience. It's to erase the black experience because there are countless black veterans who also served, who also sacrificed everything for this country and who came home to poverty and segregation. The number of black veterans who were 
uh, physically abused, physically harmed, uh, uh, often lynched in their uniforms, speaks volumes about what the nations saw when they saw black people uh, 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 serving the country. They still weren't deemed fully human. And that's an uncomfortable truth that needs to be mentioned because it says something about uh, what the actual problem is, right? The third image that I, I wanna bring up from history, right? And from, from our past uh, is this image about the Little Rock Nine. Uh, and in this picture, Elizabeth Eckford here walking to school and being confronted with these mobs. This is important because again, when we talk about the myths that are projected onto black bodies, the idea that uh, uh, people aren't interested in education, which is not true. Um, and you see here a young girl, 15 years old, being forced to walk through a mob of people who are upset because she dares to get an education. I mean, and I, I want to turn often when we talk about issues of, of uh, race, we highlight the experience of black and brown folk and we sort of put it on them. We project everything on them and say, well, it's their problem. But really, I want to turn that on its head. And you can see from this image, this woman right behind Elizabeth Eckford, who's, who's screaming at her, um, has kind of become famous. Um, and it's important to see this picture and to think something has happened to this woman that is troubling. And yes, of course, black, pe black and brown folk are, of course, suffer a great deal from racism, um, but nobody comes out clean. And white people have suffered as well, because I would say that something has gone terribly wrong in this uh, woman's heart and mind to be behaving like this because a girl is walking to school to get an education. Uh, and so we need to speak on that. And bringing it back to today, this is uh, from the day when uh, people stormed the Michigan State House to protest stay at home orders during a global pandemic, where it's been made clear that it's countless it's it's well documented that black and brown uh, uh, people are, are suffering predominantly from from this pandemic, uh, and yet you had people coming in with assault rifles, coming in without masks. Clearly, as you can see, to shout in the face of people who were trying to keep people safe. Uh, and I think this is important to mention because it speaks to who has the right to speak up in this country who has the right to protest and in what means and then also it was also interesting to see the uh, official response to this to see how officers dealt with uh, uh, these individuals um, and and how it was like it was okay and when you juxtapose that with how people dealt with uh, uh, peaceful protests um, of the killing of a of a unarmed black man in, in broad daylight, uh, that's, that's also very telling about where we are as a nation. And so I bring all that up and, and awareness of history because as athletic coaches, as educators, we show our kids this idea where we are, we are taught to understand that success is not this, this straight path and it's not uh, uh, this, this um, easy arc it's often very, very difficult. It's muddy. And I would argue that it's very debatable if we're actually even in an upward trajectory. We might still be stuck in this muddiness. Um, we might be stuck in reconstruction, really, um, because so many people uh, are still being treated the same way they've been treated for uh, since, since the beginning of, of this nation. So social progress is not linear. It's not linear. So we need to understand that. Once we are aware, once we have the context, then we move to the next step, which is being intentional. Uh, and I think this is such a powerful picture because, again, the idea of intentionality is that, number one, we must examine our own biases and we must be willing to wade through our own discomfort and wade through 
uh, uh, what holds us back from being in solidarity with people who, who need our help. Uh, and I highlight Megan Rapino because uh, Megan Rapino was, was one of the first, if not the first, uh, prominent athlete uh, to come out in support of uh, what Colin Kaepernick was was standing for. And that's important because Megan Rapino also as as not just a, 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 a white female, uh, but an openly gay athlete as well. Um, she was willing to take all that on uh, because she understood something so fundamental, which is change requires that those with relative privilege uh, also stand up, speak up, um, and also do their part. And in her own words, which I think uh, are so powerful, uh, she says clearly, uh, you have to be willing to, to, to be uncomfortable as an ally. Right? Because if it's super easy and comfortable, then you're, you're not an ally. Uh, and she also speaks truth to power when she says, to try to break down white supremacy and break down racial bias, this is what it's going to take. And it's going to be hard. Um, and so I really applaud her for um, that stance. Um, and I think it's something that uh, when we, again, when we look at our history uh, and when we look at our present day challenges, it's important for white kids to understand that they are impacted by this as well, and that they also have a role. Um, and it's also important that we we must not forget that there are plenty of allies out there um, who are incredible role models um, for what it looks like to be in solidarity with people um, who you may not you may not live in their skin, uh, but you can still empathize with. And of course, because football is global white supremacy anti-blackness are global and they exist throughout and this is a great example if you're not familiar with this Moise Keane for Juventus uh, in a match last season playing at Cagliari uh, was subjected to uh, tons of abuse from fans and this image is from when he scored a goal towards the end of the match um, and to make it 2-0 I believe and Juve won, won the match and he celebrated in front of in front of the fans who'd been abusing him all game. And later his teammate, uh, Bonucci, I believe it was, comes out and says, well, actually he shouldn't have done that. And blame was 50-50 because he was inciting the crowd. And this was his celebration. And again, I said before that in order to have some of the, the, the feelings that we have about black people in this country, or, or, or in order to get upset, for example, when people protest and, and when people, you know, quote unquote, disrespect the flag, you need to erase black people. You need to erase their experience. And that's exactly what Bonucci did, right? Because essentially what he was saying to Moise Keane was, hey, go ahead and play football and, and, and score, but don't be you. Hide yourself, which again is impossible because the problem isn't that Moise Keane is black. The problem is that these fans are shouting racist things at him while he's playing a game of football. That's the problem. And again, compare, contrast Bonucci's stance with Megan Rapinoe's allyship, saying, hey, this is uncomfortable for me, but this is what it's going to take in order for me to be uh, an ally. Once we reflect and once we are aware of these issues, once we are intentional, we examine our biases, then we can be responsible. And responsibility, especially when we're working with kids, means understanding when to speak, but also when to pass the mic. Uh, and the, you can see here, uh, John Boyega, famous actor, has been in Star Wars and, and, and other things. And um, his impact, you can see he's, he's almost, he's moved to tears in this speech. Um, and it's important that we understand the, 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 the spaces that we're in and speaking truth to power in the spaces that we're in so that we can empower uh, the kids that we work with um, and, and that we have a duty. We have a duty not only to coach the kids who might become George Floyd, right, who might be affected because of the color of their skin in that way, but also the kids who might become the police officer who had his knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. We're coaching them both. We have a responsibility to coach them both. And I've often thought and reflected in this time about all those officers who were there when, when George Floyd was begging for his life, 
at one point or another, they were in school. At, at some point, I'm sure they played, you know, baseball or football, uh, uh, American football or soccer, right? Football, global football. At some point, they had coaches. And I've often thought, when we're working with kids, we never know when that moment is in training or in a game when we might say something or do something that makes them have that connection that says, all right, this is how I treat people. Right? And we never know later on in their life when that might that learning might come in handy, uh, but clearly it's important, and that's our responsibility. And so I just want to highlight: you can see the the waves of people in the street from coast to coast and around the world. And this is my hometown in Seattle, Washington. And I want to highlight something that I read um, an opinion piece in the New York Times recently. Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow. Um, had, I think, a, a fantastic piece. I encourage you to look it up from June 8th. Um, and she says, our only hope for a collective liberation is a politics of deep solidarity rooted in love. It's our only hope uh, to reimagine uh, what this country can be. Um, and also, like I said, in, in youth sports, to reimagine what youth sports can be. Uh, and it starts, of course, with access. Uh, but even in the spaces that we're in now, uh, we have to be willing to do this work in order to provide uh, a, a better reality for our kids. And that's how we get to player empowerment. Uh, and this is an image from uh, the U19 team from the Columbus Crew Academy uh, from last season. Um, and actually, if you remember the very first slide I had up featured this young man um, who was from Minneapolis uh, and he was in the thick of it. Um, so, these boys are, are, we're very proud of each one of them. And when coaches are aware, when we're reflective as coaches and, and we're aware of, of context, we're aware of where our kids are coming from, and then we are intentional about our own biases and, and we're intentional uh, about, about the environments we create, and then we are responsible enough to empower the players, then you get solidarity. And then you get kids who on a field, what it looks like in football, this is why we have principles of play for kids. And it's them understanding that when they cross the lines, it's their game and they take hold of it. And so that's why this slide, when you glance over this, there are so many different things that you can take from this. But I wanna highlight a couple of things. Number one, I was very intentional about the nation in discord and the team in solidarity, because I wanna highlight this, that in athletics, we understand these ideas. We understand equity, we understand justice, we understand solidarity. It's when we have to talk about things outside of the field, seemingly outside of the field, because again, I don't think we can divorce it, which is my main point from this entire presentation. But when we talk about social issues, we seem to forget. When we talk about oppressed peoples, we seem to forget. This, the left of this screen, what you're seeing here is, you could say this is a, effectively the country that we live in now, where basically a few, and you can see what they look like, these dots here. A few people have access to the American dream and a few people have ownership of it to actually speak up. I'll give you an example as well, because when, and when we speak about, um, I spoke about language earlier, the idea of white supremacy, when we talk about what white supremacy is, some people have a very narrow view of what that means. It doesn't just mean, you know, uh, 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 the Klan and, you know, burning crosses. That's not it. It's also the idea that, for example, when an athlete speaks up, let's take LeBron James, for example, speaks up about politics or speaks up about any social issue, he's shouted down by white commentators in certain news organizations who say, hey, just shut up and dribble. That's a form of white supremacy. And essentially what it is, is the idea that in any space, only certain people have the right to that space. Certain people have the right to speak in that space. Certain people have the right to have their ideas expressed, have the right to control the bodies in that space. 
that's what it is. And it's important for us to understand that when we're going to move to uh, a more just society, it requires us to reflect on our culture. So this green circle, we might have to expand what it means to be American. That idea of who belongs, who has the right to, to speak truth to power. We have to expand that. We have to be uh, uh, intentional about that. The other thing is, when it comes to the right side here, hopefully you can see if you're a football coach watching this, then you can hopefully see a 1-4-3-3 or 1-4-2-3-1 formation. But this is essentially how we line up on a football pitch. And the important thing about that is people are in positions, they have roles, right? And even though they're coming from different places, they have different skin colors, they have different histories, they are all one and we're all on the same team, all moving together for the same objective. If you are coaching white kids in suburban America who feel like racism, and these you know deeper systemic issues don't touch them they don't they have that privilege it is part of your duty if you want to coach for social justice to help them understand that they are also part of this and that they also have a role because in football the number 2 doesn't behave the same way as the number 9 we understand that we understand that we ask something differently from our goalkeeper who even here, yes, wears a different color jersey, then we ask from our strikers or our number 11 here. We ask something different, but they're all important. And what's important about football and what's important about team sports is that in order for a team to thrive, everybody must not only understand their role, they must do it willingly and they must be so proud and understanding they must be aware intentional and responsible in executing that role in order for the team to thrive and that's exactly what we're asking for people to do in a social sense and this is an image again because history i i use um i use james baldwin a lot in in my teaching and um he instructs my coaching as well you know, he said that history is not the past, it's the present. And I think this is a powerful image because, again, it speaks to the idea that peaceful protest of the anthem or, or, or during the anthem, I should say, uh, and during and, and even of the flag is not anything new. And people have been protesting. Black people in this country have been protesting for 400 plus years. And the country has yet to find one acceptable way of protesting, which says maybe it's not the manner in which people protest, it's what they are protesting. That's the, actually the problem. I highlighted here that this is Tommy Smith, John Carlos and Peter Norman protesting injustice in front of the world uh, because Peter Norman was actually part of this protest. And it's important again, that we highlight white allies throughout history uh, because their role is important. Peter Norman, if you can see here, he has this patch, which is the patch of the OPHR, uh, the Olympic Project for Human Rights. It's the same patch Tommy Smith and John Carlos have. Um, and actually it was Peter Norman's idea that they share uh, this pair of gloves because Tommy Smith and John Carlos only had one pair of gloves that they went up to the podium with. And so Peter said, hey, you should both be raising a fist, so maybe share the gloves. Um, and he was part of it. And it's worth noting as well that when he got back to Australia, um, he was ostracized, to put it mildly. It was not a welcome thing that he did standing up with these black individuals to protest uh, black oppression throughout the world, throughout and, and, and in the United States. Tommy Smith and John Carlos, of course. Um, lost a lot, sacrificed a lot, all because they wanted to call attention to the plight of their people in a country that wanted to just avoid it, right? That was happy being, uh, not being unaware because people were aware, but clearly didn't want to face it.
So it's important that we know those stories. So what next? Um, and you're asking, well, how can I take this back to my club? Again, it starts with you. It starts with being aware, educating yourself, understanding context. It starts and then being intentional, examining your biases, being purposeful, and then being responsible enough to seize the moment and be accountable. Um, and when I say seize the moment, I hope that we don't lose the momentum that that the energy of the streets has has brought. And we've seen this before. We've seen where where people have have risen up and then it's dissipated also because there's a backlash of course uh, because we revert back to uh, the same old distractions and and ideas of you know well what about this and what about that which again is just avoidance it's just avoidance of facing anti-blackness facing ideas of white supremacy and so i challenge everybody who's listening on this to uh, speak truth to power in the spaces in which you're in as coaches, as educators, of course, we have to nourish joy. We have to establish policies and encourage behaviors that empower players for transformational change. What that looks like on any given, uh, uh, in any given training session in any field in America can be as simple as, how do you greet your players before training starts? Do you greet all the players? What kind of feedback do you give players as they play or at breaks? for not just your black and brown kids but for all of the kids you of course again like i said we have to understand differentiation as coaches are you do you have the kind of rapport and are you building the kind of relationships with your kids that you understand what their day was like before they come to your practices and if you have a kid who you know might have experienced trauma uh, uh in their life or or had a tough school day are you then intentional about how you coach them during that session and i'll give you a very clear example in schools throughout this country it's well documented that black and brown kids especially black males um especially but it also happens to uh, uh young black girls as well are disciplined far more regularly than white students it's very well documented and even in the city of seattle my home to the city that i grew up in uh Black students are far more likely to be punished. And sit for things simply as, as subjective as they were disrespectful to the teacher or the teacher didn't like this or that. So think about a student who may have had a tough day at school, may have been reprimanded severely for something that they just saw a, a white student get away with, Maybe they go home and mom or dad is struggling for whatever reason because of uh, 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 financial issues or because, hey, they, they just witnessed somebody get gunned down in the street. And now this student, this young person then has to pick up and go to your soccer practice after facing all that. Imagine what state they are in. And this is the reality for so many of our kids. And now we coach them. And if you're a coach who hasn't reflected and, and is not aware of where your kids are coming from, isn't intentional about uh, how you coach, then you can't be responsible. And then you can't empower. And again, it's not just for the black and brown kids because we know they suffer. And yes, they suffer dis disproportionately and, and we must, uh, be honest about that. But it's also if you are in white spaces and working in, in areas of privilege, it's also for those kids because one day those worlds collide and we need to prepare our kids for that. To further make the connection of how this relates to football. Uh, many of you, if you are um, familiar with coaching education uh, circles, you'll know Todd Beam's name. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to uh, call him a friend. And I wanted to share this because I think it's such a great way to finish this because it's about shifting the paradigm of how we teach and how we coach. If we teach football as a series of technical actions, our players see football as such. 
right? So if we teach the game as, hey, it's just how you control the ball and how you kick the ball, essentially, players are going to understand the game that way. If, on the other hand, we teach it as a game of spatial relationships, how do you create uh, uh, angles in order to move the ball up the field? How do you move in relationship uh, to your teammates? Then your players will see football as such. How we see the game prejudices how we teach it. And a paradigm is perpetuated. And of course, the legendary player example of that idea of football being about space, uh, Xavi Hernandez spends the entire 90 minutes looking for space on the pitch. That's how he saw the game. And it wasn't just Xavi, it was all the players in that system. So taking that idea, this is what it looks like for social justice. If we teach life as a series of individual actions, our children see life as such. If we teach life as a product of spatial relationships, our children see life as such. How we see the world prejudices how we teach it. And a paradigm is perpetuated. You can substitute life for history. Because again, history is not just the past, it's also the present. You can uh, substitute life for social studies, social issues. Children are taught in this country to treat issues of race and racism as a series of individual actions. And that's where you get statements like, oh, it's, it's just about treating everybody uh, nice. And it's just about, um, you even get the idea of, of the cop, police officers, police violence being a uh, virtue of just a few bad apples. That's with a paradigm of life is about individual actions. And it's not true because what we end up doing then is blaming the victims for their situation. If on the other hand, we teach our society, we teach our history, we teach our current life, as a product of spatial relationships, the way different groups of people have interacted, the way power dynamics have, have, have occurred, the way white supremacy interacts with anti-blackness, the way race interacts with class, interacts with gender, it interacts with sexuality, then our children will see the world as such. And then we can empower them for a better reality. The ultimate goal, and I will end it here, is that none of the kids leave our environments without their mindset transformed. They might arrive thinking one thing, right? Oh, it's going to be easy, and, and this, is, this is how I'm going to play, and, and this is what life means, and this is my narrow view of the world. But by virtue of being in our environments, they quickly learn that nobody has got anywhere without working hard, by showing tremendous discipline and by taking responsibility for their actions. And that's what ultimately separates the best from the rest. So they might arrive thinking one thing, but uh, by being aware, by being intentional and by being responsible, they leave transformed. And that's how we can coach for social justice. Thank you so much for your time. Brilliant. Matanda, can you hear me okay? There's questions that have come in. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. That was uh, one of the first, uh, I got a WhatsApp, WhatsApp message from Barry Webb, all the way from Cornwall, England. And he's, he says this, he says, this is actually a statement. Can you please let Matanda know how proud I am of this webinar? So powerful and true, just in case I disconnect. So he's coming all the way from England. So that's the first statement. Then we have some questions that have come through. Um, but I also want to, Ponder, obviously, uh, you know, we messed, I messed up at the beginning, people couldn't hear us, but you, you said you were standing on the shoulders of giants, which was your parents who were on this. Um, so to them, thank you for raising such a wonderful young man uh, that you are. Um, and I sure they got a sense of pride uh, just watching you and listening to you and getting those goosebumps. The first question goes as such from Debbie. It says, emotionally, physically, and mentally, we are all the same as newborns. Our culture develops the person we become. If you, if you grow up in poverty, you change, less opportunity to excel. So often the past generates the future. If things aren't changed, how can we overcome this? So bit of a statement, but also uh, some question in there. Can you unpick that? Because it was quite long there. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> it was quite long, and I appreciate. I first of all, let me say thank you um, to her for that statement and question. I think 
how can we unchain the the, the question I'm pulling and, and Chris correct me if I'm uh, if I'm pulling something different. So just asking, how can we change? How can we change and overcome this? Yeah. How can we, you know? Right. So how I can think we you answer those questions during that? Yeah, essentially, how can we change something that's so daunting? Um, and I hear that, like it's so it's so ingrained. This is a huge system, right? So I'm hearing in that question that is, hey, we we have this these problems that have been here for so long, and how do we deal with that? And like I said, there are we cannot change 400 plus years of history in one webinar or overnight or in one training session. I, I understand that and nor should that even be sort of the the goal what we can do and this is what i've tried to lay out in this webinar is what we can do is take stock of what our uh our role is and our um the power we have because we actually have more in some cases than we actually think the whole point of this as well and connecting it with football is that um, i hope people understand we already have the tools to understand this and that's why that slide, for example, that had, you know, the nation in discord and the, the team in solidarity. Um, when it comes to sports, we already speak in terms of social justice because we understand that when you have teams, uh, people on a, on a team that don't understand one another, where, where uh, when you have a team of people who uh, uh, aren't able to actually communicate honestly with one another, that team isn't very successful. So we understand that. Now it's just making sure that we treat our society as a big team. Uh, and of course, there are some people who aren't going to get it. So to, to Debbie's point about how do we change things, I personally am not interested in convincing people of my human dignity, my self-worth. That's not my role. It isn't my job. It is no nobody, no person of color. It is nobody's job to convince other people that they have value. That is innate. You cannot change that. I have value. What I, and in understanding that, in reflecting on that, it is my job to take whatever gifts or talents or passions that I have in order to try to create a better reality for the people ultimately the kids in this case that I work with, uh, the people who I come in contact with. So how can you change? It starts with you. It starts with you reflecting on, am I aware? Do I understand the history? And when I say history, again, I'm not talking about the past. Do you understand what's going on? When people look out into the streets and they see this uprising, are they, are they actually understanding why people are so upset? Or are they just kind of looking at it like, oh, well, I, I don't really get this. If you're that person who says, oh, I don't really get this, you have some some reading to do then you then it starts with then the next thing is to be intentional about how you move through the world and understanding that okay i have these biases and then how do i go about uh, uh dealing with those uh and then you move to a place of then you can move to a place of responsibility and that i'll end with this you know i'm i have a fantastic coaching mentor um and chris p you know who i'm talking about um but my my coaching mentor and i have incredible conversations um, all the time. And what I love about him, he's, he, he has got so much knowledge and, 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 and so much, uh, a wonderful experience. And he's such a, an incredible, uh, uh, life-changing person to be around. And the thing I love about him is he's willing to constantly say what he doesn't know. And he's constantly willing to learn as a white male. He's constantly talking to me about, man, I've been sleepwalking on this. Those are exact words from him. Um, and I commend him for that. I applaud him for that um, because I think that's the way you, growth starts. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Or yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So this is a statement too. It says, "Thank you, Matanda, uh, for your candid and thoughtful presentation." Chris, thank you for hosting. Very insightful, inspiring, and th these conversations are so important. Awesome job, guys. Thank you. And that was from Richie Gay Gray from Florida Rush. Um, another question has uh this is matt ream another statement it says this has been an excellent presentation thank you matanda i did have a question what are some of the strategies activities you could recommend to either tie into training sessions or off the field to nurture awareness 
and empathy in younger players. The next comes from Matt Ream in Iowa. No, I, I love it. Thank you for that question, Thanks, Matt. Matt. And um, yeah, it's a great question. I think one thing that I immediately think about when, so I, I spoke earlier about um, avoidance, how we, we like to avoid um, these topics with young kids. And I've been in this situation uh, coaching young children where even, you know, maybe people will, will this will ring a bell for people. Young kids, maybe even as young as six or seven, are, are playing and one young child will say something descriptive, right? To a teammate saying, oh, you know, this, this, uh, this black child or um, that coach who's black. And some kids might turn and say, oh, shh, don't say that. You can't say that, that's racist. And really the idea there is that even the mention of black, even as a descriptive is it, it, black is taught as something that's bad. And it's like, oh, we can't even mention that. And I think when it comes to young kids, even though, yes, we're not going to, you know, uh, throw a, a James Baldwin book at them and expect them to read that and digest that and understand that. But what we can often uh, do is, is, again, be intentional about the language that we use in front of them and that they use with one another. So really, to me, with young kids, it's about communication. It's about how do we how do they speak to one another? You know, what are the even the the subtle things that are that uh, that that develop sort of. Um, that, that kids do that sort of show insecurity. For example, you know, you show kids a certain action and kids will, will get on some other kid because they'll be like, oh, don't show off if, if somebody uh, is expressing themselves with the ball or something. And it's like, you know, we have to knock that idea out. Uh, we want to be, you know, we want to show off our skills when we play. We want to be good. It isn't that that's that's the insecurity that that white supremacy has really. Right. That that's what it is. And, and so it's tackling that in every way that that happens. Um, I think in terms of concrete activities, listen, obviously with COVID, it, it's it's dif difficult because now we have this social distancing and it ruins football in a way because football is about touching people, right? It's about space, it's about interacting, it's a social sport. But I think something as simple as encouraging young players to celebrate goals together. So if you're playing small-sided games, you know, make it even a rule. Right. That, hey, this goal doesn't count unless you have a cool celebration and all of a sudden kids are coming together and they're celebrating together. That is about solidarity. Because think about it. If I'm the kid who is, again, the left back or I'm, you know, on the other side of the field and I see my teammate score, if only that child celebrates. That says something about the environment that we have as a team. But if everybody goes and celebrates with that child. That is a team in solidarity. Those are kids who understand, hey, it's not just about me. It's about what we do as a collective. So, and there is, so, I mean, there's so many other concrete examples, but um, I think let's let's start there with communication um, and with, with kids understanding that it's not necessarily just about them. It's about celebrating their teammates as well. Yeah, huge. And, uh, you know, we do use that in the small-sided games. So, for example, the goal doesn't count unless everybody's touching whether it's knees or something or creating a, a thing like that so there's some more more statements and we're getting questions in and i want to be sensitive of your time obviously because we had a run through as well this is from jackie de la cruz and it says thank you moo uh meeting you at seattle you was an honor and a pleasure thanks for the work you're doing uh gracias that is from jackie de la cruz from your way um this is from melissa uh galifo garcia thank you for putting this together matanda really enjoyed tuning in and can't wait to share with my staff here in Columbus. So brilliant. And this is from Change Quasele. It says, how do good clubs uh, do better? Because many sports think they are doing enough and little room to grow. And that came in uh, at about 15 minutes ago, but um, so I if believe you can that, answer Change's question. Yeah, and her, um, if I'm, if I, if I'm correct, that, that, woman who asked that is uh my sister and her name is change change uh, thank you for correcting me no no uh, she's uh she is a powerhouse of an individual i stand on the shoulders of giants uh, i consider her a giant um she's actually a, a doctoral candidate at the university of michigan right now um and she's doing amazing work so and i, I appreciate her so much for um her question um 
how do good clubs do better? So I'll give you an example of what we're doing at the Columbus Crew. Um, you know, we recognize that we have a role, especially as an MLS academy, to be at the forefront of, uh, uh, of not just necessarily this conversation for, for our players, but also just in terms of developing young people and making an impact on the landscape of youth soccer. Uh, we have an important role. Um, as I mentioned before, I consider, maybe I mentioned before, if I didn't, uh, then, then I'll mention it now. I consider my role right now is if I'm working sort of as a uh, gatekeeper of sorts because of the position that I occupy, I see part of my mission as making sure that, again, the academy is accessible to kids who previously maybe never even would have encountered that. So whether that's scouting in different places or whether that's working with clubs to uh, make sure that the pathway is a little bit clearer so that it's not just the kids who are paying thousands of dollars um, who have who potentially could be part of the Columbus Crew Academy. Uh, that's important. That's something that we actively, as a staff, I work on a, with a fantastic staff, um, and it's something that we talk about, and it's something that we have to do better, That we and we know this, um, but we, in our environment, um, have that work to do. So I would say, how can good clubs do better? Again, it starts with being aware of what the challenges are within your context, within your uh, uh, space, and then working intentionally to try to remove barriers to play um, and try to improve the level of, of, of not just coaching education, but also just the player experience for the youngest and most underrepresented populations, um, because that's what it needs. If we don't do that, then all of these conversations um, only go so far, um, because at the end of the day, we may need to make sure that we uh, make this game more accessible to the kids who um, who are left out. Yeah. So around the world, this is obviously a uh, uh, you know working class sport, with the exception of this country, right? Um, and it starts it starts with us. You know, it's, it does start with us. You you were very intentional that it starts with you know one coach and. Uh, like Gandhi said, be the change you seek. You know, this this is a question from Kyle. He says, are there any clubs that have these transformation transformative models in place to connect with and learn from? So you did mention the Columbus crew. Um, is there any any anywhere else that you think that people can look at this framework and, and go, bam, you know, this is something we need to implement immediately? Well, so I'll be honest and I'll be can I don't want this to sound like um self-promotion because it's, it's but it's it's more of just the reality and how I again I approach this humbly nothing I've said today is uh you know hasn't been said in 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 many other forms um but what I'm saying is that I I can only speak to the environments um that I'm working in um and the people that I'm working with and I can say that you know when we as a staff sit down and we have these conversations yeah we recognize that we also work like for example now we work within um the, the, the structure of a, of a larger corporate club, right? Uh, I'm, I'm just one member of a team of people um, that also has a first team that has their own sort of team of people and statements that they put out that maybe aren't necessarily, um, that, that I don't directly influence. That being said, um, yes, we are, we are actively working on, um, on how to weave a transformational change course into uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, soccer experience for our athletes. That's something we're actively working on, and we're proud of that. Um, so, I, again, for anyone who's on this, I encourage um, if if you want to talk more about that, you know, reach out. Uh, my, uh, I'm sure Chris, you can share my my contact after this, or it's on there. Um, you can um, email. Um, but also, again, I would say do do your research in whatever club you're working in. Maybe you're you're responsible for that change. Um, in Seattle, that's essentially what I did with the formation of the Rising Point. The Rising Point was founded because I saw an opportunity uh, to connect these issues of social justice to the teaching of the sport. Um, starting, of course, with the with the idea of making the sport more accessible. As 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 principle number one, uh, or or uh, pillar number one. Um, so, I'm sure there are people, very good people, doing this work um, at other places. I can only speak to what we, what the crew are doing, um, and what I myself have done 
um, in the past and what I continue to try to do. So hopefully mm -hmm. that's, um, that's, yeah, that's as honest as I can be, but I appreciate no, that that's, question. That's brilliant. And I think uh, Atlanta United are doing something with the futsal courts, like you said, and yeah, um, no, people are doing work in inner cities. I know there's some stuff going in St. Louis, Missouri. I know there's stuff going in in Chicago and, you know, there needs oh, yes. to be more. Uh, so actually, no, I, I'm, no, I apologize because I think there are people I, I'm, I'm mis maybe I misunderstood. I, I answered that question is in terms of like this, the transformational change course in mm -hmm. terms of directly off the heels of, you know, George. No, you Floyd's didn't misinterpret. Right? But, I, I don't but, think you misinterpreted. I think it's, uh, it's a collective, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's no, a, but I, I will shout out a few people that I know are doing some incredible work that I follow personally. Like, um, I mean, there are clubs again. I think these people so. Again, Rising Point right now is sort of, I don't like to say on hold because I, I take Rising Point with me wherever I go. That's how I coach. Um, but I know the Rising Point, we were doing great work in Seattle um, and programs like that need more funding. Um, somebody, a group that I follow that I need to connect with um, that I think has done incredible work um, is uh, Sheriff's Club. If people are not familiar with them, Sheriff's out of, uh, I believe, San Jose area um, in California because they created essentially a, uh, I think a, essentially a free, if not, or a, uh, a relatively low cost uh, club um, that what was started in order to make sure that uh, uh, like kids in the Latino community could have access to this game at the highest levels without, you know, costing them a fortune. I mean, it's a powerful thing. And, and I, I'm, whenever I follow them, I'm, I'm inspired uh, to see what they've done. Uh, Joy of the People is another club that I think in Minnesota uh, it is a club that I think is is a, is an incredible um, uh, model. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and they're the whole yeah, and I and, and in researching there just, are a bunch of other things. Yeah, Eric's just chimed in as well. He just says I love the work of models city and the community are doing with NYCFC. So That's you know, one. there's some models that people can look at. Um, as well. and then this, 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 this question uh, is coming by text and it says, do you have any suggestions, RE conversation openers to discuss biases slash blind spots? Yeah, I would say the pre hopefully the, the whole goal of this presentation was also to give people a roadmap. I, I think yeah. it starts, like I said, it starts with self-reflection. There's nothing that I've presented today that I haven't, to you all, that I haven't had to reflect on uh, myself. And I think this is a good point to add, um, and apologize if I didn't add it before or have it in my presentation, but, you know, again, in, the idea of intersectionality is important, right? So the idea that we're not just, you know, we don't move through the world with just one identity, that we are many things at one time. Um, and this relates to what I what I mentioned about simplicity and complexity. The, the 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 complexity of it is of our reality is that I move through the world not just as a as a as a, a black person. I move through the world as as an African man, uh, right? A man, a, a, a brother, a, a a father, a husband. As a male in this society, I have relative privilege. Uh, compared to women who suffer from sexism, who suffer from patriarchy. So how do I begin a tough conversation? With self-reflection and also understanding that there are certain things that I need to empathize with. And there are certain things that I for sure get wrong when it comes to sexism, for example. There are for sure things that I don't think about uh, that I need to be reminded of. And then when I am, great. I, it gives, me, it gives uh, me an understanding of how to empathize, but then that should also provide other people of a roadmap of how to empathize with me, even if they're not black. So how do you start difficult conversations? By starting with your own uh, awareness of yourself, being intentional, and so then you can have, uh, you can be responsible in the conversations that you have with people. Yeah, and uh, obviously you and I had a conversation on bias with, with James, right? Um, uh, about the bias with the FedEx, mm -hmm. Remember the FedEx picture I showed us? And then right, we can't yeah, take yeah. our eyes off the arrow, right? Uh, Change, did I pronounce it right that time, Matanda? Change? Change, Change, yeah. Change, Change just said, also tap into other professions, social workers and other fields have many anti-racist social justice resources that can be beneficial to coaches. So Change, thank you for, for, for letting us know that as well. And then um, this is from Eric. Eric, Eric says, 
fabulous, inspiring presentation. Your voice is powerful. I appreciate it. I love the connection you made with the paradigm shift. It seems true that in football, cultural competence needs to be coached at a as a fundamental skill. So Eric, thank you for your words there. Um, hopefully people can see my screen and they may have missed it at the beginning, but we, we saw yesterday the, the Premier League's back, right? Um, and as you can see, every player and officials took a knee on the backs of the shirts. This is John McGinn. Can you see my screen, Matunda? Can you see the Villa player yep. taking a knee? Um, yep. You know, every player in the Premier League had on their back of their shirts, Black Lives Matter. Um, John Gordon, yesterday, uh, it was a daily positive, And he said, we need four C's now more than ever. Number one was communication. Where there is a void, negativity will fill it. Number two, connection. Build band bonds of trust. Number three, commitment. Big we before little me. Big we before little me. And number four, caring. Letting people know they matter and you value them. Um, Matunda, this has been powerful. It's been inspirational. Uh, you have given me the air today, right? You have given me the air to go back to to uh, your your acronym, you know, the awareness, the intentionality and the responsibility to want to do more, to be more, to help more. Uh, and as coaches, we have a very big responsibility. We have a big responsibility to help our players, you know, and uh, I heard you talk about solidarity with teams. And this is this is us. This is how we can bring our teams together and everybody we work with. Um, you know, Matanda, what final words would you would you give? You know, we've we've been on. We started recording. People got on with us eventually, and 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 went on this journey with us. What final words would you would you give? Oh, first of all, and I, I again, I would say, I mean, I, I've enjoyed this immensely, and there's. I don't, I mean, it's worth taking the time. I appreciate everybody taking the time. You could have been doing anything at this time today and you chose to spend that time with us. So thank you so much. Um, and I would just say that we, uh, it is difficult to put into words how, what it feels like to, live in a nation where you think that you, you you don't think things are actually getting better because you see the return to uh normalcy even even after something so horrific as uh the killing of george floyd and you can already start to see the patterns in in both in responses but also in some in some cases the uh, the things also that have happened after and, and still the lives that are continue to be lost. Um, and that gets, um, that gets very depressing and infuriating are the, are the right words. What gives me hope and what I want to leave people with is as difficult as it is to wade through white supremacy, to wade through anti-blackness, privilege, to wade through the realities of, of the economic disparities that exist in, in the country and the world, to wade through all that and the impact that that has had, especially on black and brown people. As difficult as that may be, what I often come back to is think about how difficult it must be or the mothers and fathers who get a phone call or however they, they hear that their loved one has just lost their life. And in this fashion, in any fashion, that would be hard. But I, I often try to put myself in that place. Um, and especially now that I have a son, I meant it when I said before, I hope that I want my boy to live longer than Tamir Rice. Tamir Rice was 12 years old. He was 12 years old. And so whatever, however hard this is, I, I wake up every day, uh, I kiss my boy, I smile at him, and I'm just so thankful that I can hold him and hug him and I wanna see him grow in a world that's better than this. 
And that's the same for everybody out there, right? No matter where you're coming from, everybody has the same goal. And so I guess my challenge for people is to just understand that uh, uh, this is a matter of life and death. And I know that's heavy, but that's how I approach the game of football. Of course, it's joy, it's fun, it's a game. But the reason that I don't uh, uh, separate coaching for social justice and coaching the X's and O's of the game is because I, I cannot divorce those two. Because my son's life depends on it. And that's what I want to leave people with. And I think, um, again, uh, there is there is a lot of good in this world. I don't want to say there's not. But it's on us to make sure that people who would who would otherwise be comfortable and be happy remaining within their comfort, that we make them uncomfortable in order to stand with historically silenced people, because that's how then we can affect change and create a better reality. And I can't thank you enough for uh, this time in this space. Um, and I encourage everybody to stay well, be healthy um, and keep up the good fight and connect with other people who are doing the same. Right. So thank you very much. I'm privileged to be part of this, just like you are. Fantastic. And uh, I turned off my camera because the sound was glitching. I don't want you to think that I wasn't on or that I was having indeed a COVID or bad hair day. Um, but I, I want to leave people with this as well. And you, you summed it up wonderfully well. And I, I want to thank you for being eye opening. Right. And and um, giving people goosebumps right, the, the positive feedbacks we've had in this. The other thing I, I want us to consider is, is remember, you know, as coaches, our children metaphorically are getting picked up and dropped off at different bus stops. But it's important that we're there to meet them, you know, and meet them from their start, spots and know what kind of a day they've had. And then I'd like to leave it with this quote, Matanda um, from Maya Angelou, which I found very fitting. Uh, and it says, it is time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there is beauty and that there is strength. All right, so listen, uh, it's been brilliant. I love being uh, part of your journey and I love that you're part of mine and I can't thank you enough, my friend, and I look forward to seeing Mateo and I look forward to meeting you in person. Um, there's been a few things that have come on, uh, questions. Uh, this is Pablo Toledo, who's uh, the leader of our coaching education team here at Rush. He said, this was a great webinar, incredible, incredible presenter. I want to thank Matunda as well on behalf of our entire organization. So that's Pablo Toledo. So fantastic, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Matunda, for joining us. Uh, apologies for the, for the technical difficulties that we had. Um, but uh, it was brilliant and we can't thank you enough and we look forward to seeing everybody and, and sharing the video soon. Matanda, we'll talk on the other side, my friend. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, Chris. Yeah, uh, hopefully it was okay. I feel the uh, is this off of my go to? Should I just sign off of go to? And it says it's still being recorded. Oh, okay. So I'm just I can just go ahead and close up then. All right. Yeah. Yeah.